Welcome back everybody to another reaction video taking a slight pause from the Simon Bolivar series. We're not giving up on that. It will be back later on today or early tomorrow. Uh, but I really wanted to dive into something a little different just uh, so that folks, we don't lose folks who might not be as interested in that. So I want to kind of keep a variety instead of just doing six straight days of nothing but Simon Bolivar. I want to dive into uh, talking about the bloodiest battle ever fought uh, in Britain. Uh, and that is the Battle of Towton, which was fought up in the north, up uh, not too far from York. Uh, it was the uh, most decisive battle of the Wars of the Roses. Uh, tens of thousands of deaths, just massive. And when you think about the population uh, of uh, England at the time, it was a significant portion of England's population who fought in and died in the Battle of Towton. And I have my own family ties to it. One of my ancestors was killed uh, leading troops on the eve of the Battle of Towton at a place called Ferry Bridge. I'm sure we're going to get into that. His name was John Clifford. Uh, and that reminds me, I've had a lot of inquiries uh, lately about doing family history research. I want to let you know that this week we're going to be doing some videos where I'm going to be talking about family history and showing you some tips on how to get started on your own. Uh, but I've also had a lot of people reach out to me about hiring me to do research. Uh, and you can email me at vloggingthroughhistory uh, at gmail.com. The email's in the link in the description if you want to ask, and I can give you the details about what that looks like. Um, I am doing research for a couple of people right now, so it might take some time before I can get to you, but we can certainly get you in the queue for that. But let's go ahead and dive into the Battle of Towton today. This video was suggested and sponsored by our patron, Jetson. You can join the ever-growing army of kings and generals via Patreon or YouTube membership. And I should mention too, I didn't already mention this, but this is my first time reacting to a kings and generals video. They've got fantastic content. I highly recommend it. Uh, some of their stuff I want to get into eventually, but it's longer, so I need to really kind of plan it out. But the link's in the description to this video. Make sure you check them out and give them a subscribe. Wars often happen because different sides have intractable contradictions, but each new war often creates the causes for the next one. The Hundred Years' War between England and France was no different, causing many conflicts in Europe. In England, the Wars of the Roses stemmed from the Hundred Years' War. Yep. The first phase of that conflict culminated in the bloodiest battle fought on English soil, the Battle of Towton. The King of England, Edward III, had five sons who survived into adulthood. And if you want to know a lot more of this in detail, check out my series uh, that I did reacting to the Hundred Years' War uh, on Extra History. Uh, they go into a lot more detail about all of this and how this became the root cause for what became the Wars of the Roses. For the first time in English history, he created duchies for them, making his sons the biggest landowners in the country. On the one hand, this strengthened the crown, but at the same time it formed a new class of nobility which had claims to the throne and enough power to vie for it. Edward's son and heir, the famous Hundred Years' War commander, Edward the Black Prince, passed away in 1376, followed by the king himself a year later. The Black Prince's son was crowned as Richard II. The reign of this monarch was tumultuous. The Peasants' Revolt of 1381 was followed by the Parliamentary Crisis of 1386 to 1388. Richard's attempts to reach peace with France, his marriage to the young Valois princess, the lack of an heir, and the constant strife with the nobility made him deeply unpopular. Richard's cousin and one of the most powerful lords, the Duke of Lancaster, Henry Bolingbroke, was exiled to France in 1398. And this is how you get, if you're wondering about Wars of the Roses, and I, I don't believe from my understanding that this was something that was largely, like they didn't call it the Wars of the Roses at the time, and it, it wasn't really framed that way. It was more often referred to as like the Cousins War, because that's really what it was, it was a family war between two branches of the, of the same family, all descendants of Edward III, but the Lancastrians... Uh, which are the Red Rose, come from the fact that it, uh, that claim all goes to the Duke of Lancaster, uh, or Lancaster, uh, and then the, the Yorkists, or the White Rose, come from the Duke of York, which you'll see later on. 
In May of 1399, Richard embarked on a campaign in Ireland, and Henry used the opportunity to return to England. He immediately garnered enough support to dethrone Richard and assumed the throne as Henry IV, the first Lancastrian king. And he made a good point at the beginning. Had Edward III not created these royal dukedoms, uh, you probably don't have another noble that's got the power on his own to be able to usurp a king like this. And so Edward III did a lot of really good things. And we actually see some of those even to this day. If you happen to watch Prince Philip's funeral the other day, you may have seen all the flags hanging in St. George's um, chapel where they had the funeral. That's kind of the headquarters of the Order of the Garter, which was founded by Edward III. It's a, a chivalric order. Uh, and of course, Prince Philip was a member of that, as is the Queen. She's the head of the Order of the Garter. Uh, Prince William was actually the 1,000th member. You can only ever have 25 members. There are a couple of ex officio members. I won't get into all that, but um, you can only have, ever have 25 members at any given time. So you can only create them as other people die. Um, but he created that. That was a really great thing, and others tried to copy it. Uh, but this creating the royal duchies for his five sons in the end creates a lot of strife over the generations to come. Richard was arrested and died in 1400, while his heir presumptive, another grandson of Edward III, Edmund Mortimer, was bypassed. That created legitimacy problems for the king, and he faced at least six significant rebellions. In 1413, Henry IV succumbed to chronic disease and was succeeded by his son Henry V. The new king was one of the most talented monarchs of England during this era. In 1415, he renewed hostilities with France and won an impressive victory at Agincourt. In less than a decade, he conquered more French land than any English king before him. The Treaty of Troyes was signed with France in 1420, according to which Henry married French Princess Catherine. Their descendants would inherit the French throne after the death of Charles VI the Mad. And two things here, we've talked about some of this uh, in previous videos. Charles the Mad, uh, obviously the weakness of France comes in large part because of the madness of their king. And you're going to see the same thing in the next generation because... This child, who is supposed to inherit England and France, who becomes Henry VI, who's the son of uh, Henry V and of Catherine of Valois, uh, ends up having his own mental health issues that lead to instability in England, which create the vacuum of power that allows for the Wars of the Roses to take place. Both sovereigns passed away in 1422. Henry V's son, Henry VI, who was less than one year old, was crowned as the King of England. The king's uncle, John of Bedford, became the regent and took command in France, while his other uncle, Humphrey of Gloucester, looked after English affairs. Although Bedford was a decent commander, the French soon rallied around Jean of Arc, and Charles VII was crowned as King of France in Rheims. Henry's coronation in Paris was a mere symbol. By the time Henry reached adulthood and started governing in 1437, Bedford was dead and the situation in France was untenable. The king was weak and easily swayed by his nobles, and at that point the peace party led by Edmund of Somerset and William of Suffolk had more influence on the king than the war party of Gloucester and Richard of York. And so Richard of York is the descendant of two different branches of the um, of Edward the Third, two of his five uh, sons, and so he's gonna uh, lay claim to the throne through multiple lines. Uh, though he doesn't lay claim to it right away, and we've talked about this in other videos as well. Uh, at the time, you you don't want to be seen to be a traitor by rebelling against the king, and so the way that you do what you do instead is you say, you know what, the king, I'm a loyal servant of the king, 
but he's got bad advisors. And what I'm doing is I'm actually rebelling against these bad advisors. And that's what Richard is trying to do. As the senior most uh, noble uh, in the kingdom, as the really the legitimate heir to the throne, but he's not claiming that. He says, you know what? I should be the one who is governing on behalf of our king who can't govern for himself. I should be the regent. I should be the Lord Protector, not these other guys. And when he's repeatedly passed over uh, in favor of other people, eventually he's going to say, you know what? Forget this. I'm claiming the throne. Uh, And and really, it would have been a fairly one-sided battle uh, if it weren't for the fact that Henry VI was married to Margaret of Anjou, who is a pretty tough girl in her own right. Uh, she's she's from Anjou down here in France, and uh, she's the one who really becomes the Lancastrian leader during all of this. The sides agreed to peace at Tours in 1444. According to their agreement, Henry was to marry Charles' niece, Margaret of Anjou, and return men and Anjou to France. The marriage and the peace conditions were unpopular in England. Among those who protested was Gloucester, and that gave Henry a chance to imprison his uncle in 1447. Gloucester died shortly after, and this weakened the war party even more. Richard, who commanded the English lands in France, was stripped of his office and sent to govern Ireland, which was an exile. Somerset and Suffolk became dukes in this period. However, Suffolk was exiled under popular pressure and then murdered. Hostilities with France were renewed and Somerset, who was appointed the commander in Normandy, lost all the northern holdings save for Calais by 1450. And this is why you see the Duke of York coming back and trying to assert his rights, because Somerset is screwing up bad and they hate seeing this happen and this is an opportunity then to step in and say hey this guy's tearing our country apart let me do the job and returned to england he and queen margaret had the king under their influence the prestige of the monarchy was at an all-time low The Hundred Years' War impoverished England, the losses in France were hard to swallow, and the nobles who had lost their land on the continent were unhappy. At the same time, all the duchies created in the last century had become too strong and independent, and the dukes often had personal retinues larger than that of the king. Yep. At this point, it is essential to show you the family tree of the Plantagenet dynasty as many grandsons of Edward III controlled these duchies, ushering in the era of what is controversially known as bastard feudalism. This era was characterized by the loyalty of the soldiers being to their lords rather than the king. The nobles would use that to procure offices, lands and finances from the king. These lords and their heirs would play a central role throughout the Wars of the Roses. So think about this. If you, if you look at it, think about it a different way. So as an American, imagine for a second that you have the United States of America and you've got 50 separate governors who all, let's say, they control the military in their state, if you want to put it that way. It's not the case, but let's say that was the case to try and put this in perspective. Along comes a leader in the United States who appoints five people, each who govern ten states. And now those men uh, have control over not just one of 50, but one of five. Uh, Now you can start to see, if somebody controlled, say, California, Texas, and New York, how powerful they would be and what influence they would wield. That's kind of what's happening here. It's one thing when you've got a bunch of dozens and dozens of minor nobles, barons, earls, things like that. But when you start to create these royal duchies that are uh, wealthy and powerful, and sometimes more powerful and wealthy than even the king, to this day, most of the queen's wealth comes from the Duchy of Lancaster. She's actually the Duke of Lancaster. It's one of her titles. Uh, And that's where most of the queen's wealth comes from. Most of the income for the crown comes from the Duchy of Lancaster. I think they also have the Duchy of Cornwall. Um, So this was a major misstep on Edward III's part. He created all of the 
um, the the seeds. He planted the seeds that would just blow up in England's face in the mid 1400s. Richard, who had a strong claim to the throne as a great grandson of Edward III, used the circumstances to return from exile in 1452. Although many came to his banner and demanded Somerset's arrest, the Queen's party was still stronger, and Margaret's pregnancy made her position even more secure. The so situation would change in 1453. Affected by the loss of Bordeaux and Aquitaine, the king suffered a mental breakdown and became unresponsive. Scholars still argue about the nature of this illness, but it is clear that Henry VI lost the remainder of his political power. In the north, two noble families, the Nevilles and Percys, used the lack of central power to renew a feud, and as Somerset supported the latter, the Nevilles allied with Richard. And the Neville, uh, uh, the Nevilles will, will have a man um, who will, uh, becomes the Earl of Warwick, and he becomes known as the Kingmaker because he's powerful enough that whatever side he jumps to, you're the side that's likely to win. By 1454, Richard had enough backing to become the royal protector and appoint his supporters to offices, while Somerset was arrested. However, in 1455, the king recovered, and Queen Margaret managed to influence him yet again. Richard's decisions were rolled back, and he was exiled. This time, the Duke of York wasn't going to take it, and he raised an army to move to London. The conflict that would later be called the Wars of the Roses because of the heraldic badges used by the Lancasters and the Yorks became inevitable. Henry knew that he would receive no support in London and moved out to a town called St Albans with his 2,000 men, where an at least 5,000 strong Yorkist army was waiting for him. Richard wasn't ready to dethrone Henry, so negotiations started. But as the latter refused to surrender Somerset, the Yorkists attacked. Many Lancastrian commanders, among them Somerset, were killed, while the king was captured. Richard returned him to London and was appointed the protector by Parliament. By that time, Margaret gave birth to Edward and became the leader of the Lancastrian party. It seemed that both sides were shocked by St Albans, as hostilities continued only in the form of the Percy Neville feud between 1456 and 1459. Henry attempted to reconcile the parties on a few occasions, but the suspicions were too strong, and in the fall of 1459, the sides clashed once again. So before we get into this, they keep talking about the Percys and the Nevilles. We mentioned the Nevilles already. Let's talk about the Percys for a second. Uh, probably the most famous member of the Percy family, and I, that's a family I'm descended from as well, because John Clifford, the guy I mentioned earlier as being my, my family connection to the Wars of the Roses, uh, is a descendant of the Percys as well. Henry Hotspur Percy, who the, uh, the soccer team or the football team uh, in London, uh, Tottenham Hotspur, is named after him had led a rebellion, I think, in 1403 against Henry IV. Uh, and the, the Percys controlled the lands kind of on the northern border with Scotland, and so the Percys were typically the ones who had to deal with the Scots. And so they were powerful, and they had a number of castles up there. And uh, so the Percys are very influential. Uh, and, of course, since the Battle of Towton ends up being fought outside York, the Percys play a big part in that. And so does uh, John Clifford, who fights on the Lancastrian side. This time, the Lancastrians gained the upper hand, and the Yorkists were forced to find refuge in Calais and Ireland. The Yorkists recovered quickly and returned to England in the summer of 1460. The King's forces were defeated at Northampton, and Henry was captured. Richard attempted to claim the throne, but even his staunchest supporters refused. Instead, the so-called Act of Accord was adopted according to which Henry VI would rule for life, but would be succeeded by Richard of York. Now imagine if you're Margaret of Anjou. You just had a son who's the Prince of Wales, who should be the heir to the throne, and now they're saying your son's not going to inherit, but we're going to give it to the Duke of York instead. 
they had to understand this was not going to last because even if the, that happened, even if the Duke of York takes over, if he outlives Henry, you have to think that Edward is going to want to claim the throne back and, and, and this war is going to continue. As long as somebody's alive who's got a claim to the throne, this is going to keep happening. The Queen was willing to fight for her son's inheritance and was gathering her forces in the north. Richard moved towards the Lancastrian troops to prevent their recruitment efforts, but his enemies were already on the way, and their 18,000 blockaded his 5 to 10,000 strong force near Sandal Castle. What happened next is still debated, but the Yorkists Stupidity. sallied out from the castle and were crushed near the town of Wakefield. The Duke of York is inside Sandal Castle and he's safe, and he's got reinforcements on the way. All he needs to do is sit there. But for some reason, he rides out from the castle against a superior force, and he gets killed. Uh, he uh, gets Most accounts say he got captured and was probably executed after the battle. Uh, his son, and this is where my family connection again comes in, and I keep talking about that, but it really just is a part of the history. And what's cool about family history is when you find these connections to history, it gives you a more personal connection to these events. So John Clifford, his father, uh, who had been the previous Baron Clifford, was killed, I think, at St. Albans. And uh, he held that against the Duke of York. He blamed the Duke of York for that. And so he actually captures the Duke of York's second son, Edmund, the Earl of Rutland. He's 17 at the time. Now, there's a painting who shows uh, Rutland being like a 12-year-old, but he wasn't. He was like 17. And supposedly, Clifford tells Rutland, he says, your father killed mine, and now I'm going to kill you. And he runs his sword uh, through his, his throat and kills him. And... Uh, this was something that was shown, uh, in one of the Shakespeare plays, and uh, Clifford earns the nickname The Butcher for this, but he doesn't live a whole lot longer after this. Richard of York was killed. In early 1461, his son Edward became the leader of the Yorkists. In February, he defeated a Lancastrian army at Mortimer's Cross. Meanwhile, a smaller Yorkist force under Warwick was defeated at St. Albans by the army commanded by the Queen. And the reason they call the battle the Battle of Mortimer's Cross is because there was a, I forget what the, the scientific term is for it, but it's a situation where the, the light reflects off of the ice crystals and stuff in the sky in such a way that you see like what looked like a, a sunlight cross in the sky. Uh, and so they called it the Battle of Mortimer's Cross. Edward's only a teenager at this point, but now he's got a chance to take the throne. And that's what's going to happen at Towton. Henry VI was recaptured by the Lancastrians. Edward learned about this defeat and moved south, where he united with the remainder of Warwick's troops. As Lancastrian soldiers committed atrocities in the area, Margaret and Henry lost all their support and decided to move to the north. That allowed Edward to enter London in March and take the throne as Edward IV. The showdown was imminent. Both sides continued to recruit troops over the next few weeks. Edward left London on the 13th and arrived in Nottingham on the 22nd. Here he received the news that 30 to 35,000 Lancastrian troops commanded by Somerset were to the south of the city of York. Now, to this point, most of these battles fought during the Wars of the Roses have been on a much smaller scale. But you're about to have a massive battle. I mean, think about this. This is the 1400s, mid-1400s. England's population at this time is a few million. And you're about to have a battle with like 70,000 people fighting. I mean, this was a huge, huge deal. This is on the level of... Uh, what some of the American Civil War battles. This is significantly larger than any of the battles that were fought during the American Revolution were. Edward had less than 30,000. On the 28th of March, King Edward sent Fitzwalter to secure the bridge over the Eyre River near Ferry Bridge. However, Fitzwalter was ambushed by Clifford's cavalry. Many Yorkists were massacred or drowned. King Henry had sent a messenger to negotiate, but his offer was refused. 
Edward knew that the main Lancastrian force led by Somerset was waiting two miles away, ready to crush the Yorkists if they pushed Clifford away and crossed the river. He sent a vanguard under Suffolk which managed to push the Lancastrians back to the end of the bridge. Edward then marched with the main force to Ferry Bridge and led his men personally to Suffolk's aid. To stop the Yorkist advance, the Lancastrians destroyed the bridge, but the former constructed a narrow raft to ferry across. This raft was captured by the Lancastrians, and the fight continued in the area for some time until the Yorkists managed to cross the river to the north at Castleford and set up camp. At dawn on the 29th of March, both on armies Sunday. found themselves in a snowstorm. At 11 in the morning, the Yorkists marched northward and encamped on the hill 10 miles south of York, with their backs to the village of Saxton. Edward put his men in formation. Their lines stretched for a mile along the ridge. At the same time, the Lancastrians moved north and took positions to the north of the Yorkists on high ground 100 feet above them on the Meadowland to the south of Towton. Part of their cavalry was hidden in the forest to the west of the Yorkist positions. The Lancastrians had the advantage of the high ground. The Yorkist position was shaky, as any retreat would trap them along the river. It's, Ed it's over, Edward. I have the high ground. <laughs> well, you would think so. Every advantage is to the Lancastrians in this battle. Um, the only advantage that the Yorkists have going for them is right now they technically hold the, thr the throne. Edward has claimed the crown. He's young. He he's enthusiastic. They've got their leader on the, uh, on the battlefield. Uh, the Lancastrians are following a very weak king uh, and are really instead being led by his nobles, being led by his wife. Uh, and, and honestly, what it really kind of comes down to is that they're just not fighting for a cause that um, that seems to be uh, as energetic and um, motivating to them. Uh, but you'll see how this all kind of plays out. This is a brutal, brutal battle. Edward had artillery, but the weather conditions did not allow its usage. Somerset didn't want to descend from the high ground and waited for the Yorkists to approach. The battle started with archers exchanging volleys. However, this is an interesting time in history because think about this. There's artillery. I mean, they didn't get to use it in this particular battle, but it, by the 1450s, there's artillery, there's cannons. Uh, so this is a time when you still have artillery or you still have archers, but you also have artillery and you've got firearms starting to be used on the battlefield. Some of the Wars of the Roses had guns. But the wind was blowing into the face of the Lancastrian archers, and they were unable to see the enemy properly. Their arrows fell short of the mark, and according to the sources, all they could hear through the whirlwind was the laughter of their counterparts. <laughs> That's got to be demoralizing, you know? Uh, it, it's a blinding snowstorm. It's Palm Sunday, uh, and, uh, you know... You're, you're thinking, we've got the high ground, we're in good shape. But of all things, it comes down to weather that messes you up. It does you no good to have the high ground if the wind's blowing in your face and you're being laughed at when you're trying to fire arrows. It, fascinating how battles turn on things like that. A hail of counter volleys accompanied this. The Yorkists were gathering thousands of enemy arrows and were firing them back at them, retreating after each volley to avoid the return fire. The Lancastrians suffered heavy losses and were forced to descend from the hill, taking up melee weapons and charging. And there goes your last the advantage. The Yorkist archers sent a few more volleys and then retreated behind their men-at-arms. As the main Lancaster force charged into the Yorkist army, a fierce melee began across the line. At the same time, the hidden flanking force attacked the left flank of Edward's army, did significant damage and almost routed it. Edward himself led the reserves and stabilized the situation on the left side. Still, the Lancastrians outnumbered their enemies and slowly pushed them back. It was then that the forces sent by Norfolk to assist Edward arrived. It is not clear if Edward gave an order or if the commander of this unit took the initiative, but these troops attacked the Lancastrians in the flank. 
soon Henry's forces were routed. Sources claim that 20,000 Lancastrians and up to 10,000 Yorkists were killed, making Towton the bloodiest battle fought on English soil. And you want to see something fascinating. Uh, there's a lot of documentaries on YouTube that are available that show some of the archaeological research that's been done into the Towton battlefield and some of the bodies that they've found and been examining. And they the bodies show just how brutal this battle was, the multiple severe wounds. And a lot of these men actually showed older wounds from previous battles because these were veterans of the previous battles of the Wars of the Roses. And, you know, civil wars in general tend to be much more more intimate and ugly and brutal than a war between foreign powers. Uh, so Towton showed all of those things. And I'm really excited uh, that if our planned UK trip goes off this summer, if everything allows with COVID, Towton's one of the places we're planning to visit. I'm planning on making some videos for you guys from the Towton battlefield. Uh, and if you want to support that effort, uh, you can either become a patron because everything on Patreon is going to go into that travel fund, uh, or you can go directly to the uh, GoFundMe that was set up by our mods. And those links are both in the description below, and you can support the travel fund that's going to allow for me to go and make some of these videos that I very much hope to make at places like Bosworth and Towton and others. Henry, alongside his wife and son, escaped to Scotland. Edward IV's position was strong for now, but the Wars of the Roses were just starting. We are planning more videos about the Wars of the Roses down the line, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. So yeah, definitely make sure you guys check out uh, their other stuff. Uh, subscribe to th their channel. It's fantastic. They've got some really good stuff. If you liked what you saw here, they have a lot more of it from lots of different time periods in history. Let me know your thoughts about all of that. And if there's something specific you want to see uh, in the videos that I'm going to make about researching your family history, let me know in the comment section below what you'd specifically like me to cover. And I will definitely plan on talking about that. We might make it a live stream, uh, but we'll see. So thanks for watching. Hit that like button on your way out. We'll see you again soon.